Town meeting to go. We're Jack and Bill do what I call the far side chat. Uh, there's nothing structured or anything. They can just uh, go wherever it takes them. So I'll get out of the way and uh, let's hear from Jack and Bill. I'm going to lead off uh, with a question for you, which is you gave us your respected asset class. And with stock returns, you have a term in your stand for the new version, particularly at percent. Uh, and I'm familiar with that. Uh, and I noticed there was no new version term in the bond or the bond series. And I'm going to ask you why. Okay, well, um, first I can't imagine anybody wants to hear me say anything more. I've all set out. <laughs> but that's a good question. And, uh, and that is what's different about the new version of the bond. Well, we have mean reversion in stock. It is, we have dividend yield, and we have earnings, we have earnings growth, and we have what we have mean reversion is how much people will pay for a dollar earnings. In bonds, if you hold them as investments, not as you hold them in speculation, that doesn't matter. Almost all of the bonds return over time is accounted for by the interest group bond. It's like 95% or only 100% of the bond returns, or even on the beginning. So there is no mean reversion. There would be a mean reversion. For example, or it could be to get a 30 year bond in 10 years, the interest rates could be higher or lower than bonds to wait 20 years to go. And I don't know how to predict that. So I, my own recommendation is I don't like the long bonds just fluctuate too much money. The record is quite clear that long bonds pay higher returns, intermediate and short, because when you look at their yields, long bonds yield more. And since the only source of return from the bonds is yield, um, that's what you get at the end of the period. But there shouldn't be mean reversion. If you buy an individual bond, you buy a 10-year bond, then they will tend to return more or less is, is, is going to be. But if you buy the total bond index bond, and interest rates go from whatever they are, three and a half, four percent to ten percent, your 10 year return is, is should should be lower. Well, uh, you have two factors. One, when interest rates go up, the price goes down. We discussed at some length at lunch uh, and why. Uh, but the return uh, on your reinvestment of those coupons goes up. And if interest rates go down, the price goes up, but the reinvestment goes down. And they are more or less mostly offsetting factors. So I, I think you complicate things too much when we when we try and guess what happens in shorter periods, which it can. But uh, you know, if, if, and then you get this funny timing thing. For example, if you buy this 10-year uh, bond, it's actually only about 2.4%. But if interest rates go to 10%, the price of that bond will plummet that day, or that week, or that month. And there's a difference in what happens, whether that happens on the first day you own it, or the last day you own it. Now, in a bond itself, on the last day you own it, it only has one day left of maturity, so it changes to a 10% return. So when you get those, you know, I'm just this merchant of simplicity, uh, and uh, you know, I don't know if we get 10% interest rates, which is certainly possible. Um, you know, it happens quickly. You have one in, in effect. If it happens in the middle of the period, you have another. If that's the end of the period, you get quite another. complicated. So I just like to look at it and, and uh, say, well, make the best judgment you can. I should also say this, that there doesn't seem to be any difference between my third and my third criticism. If you own the treasury bond, uh, or a treasury bond, a corporate bond, you get the same type of portfolio, you get an index fund, uh, an intermediate index fund, and that uh, the intermediate index is shifting throughout its time, the money comes in and goes out. Uh, that doesn't seem to matter if we take a look at the actual treasury bond return for that period compared to the return of the fund. And the intermediate fund is the intermediate return, treasury return, within, you know, close enough to ground control, we say. So I, I think maybe uh, we overthink it, all those, those elements all are there, but uh, I, I don't think we can afford a bet on whether interest rates go to 10% at a certain time, which is critically important. Um, because even if we're right, betting on the time is just too much guessing to make. In the long run, we bet that the odds, the correlation, Day yield on an intermediate term portfolio uh, correlation over time. And they're remarkably, I think I've got this chart. Is Kevin here? Yeah. Uh, I think we have that chart in the new book, don't we, Kevin? Well, I'm in the 91% correlation chart. Yeah. And it's, it's very
very, very consistent. Uh, you know, here, here's the initial interest rate, and here's the return over the next 10 years, and the lines are like this. Obviously, it's stayed right now along those. So I think that's the best way to do it. It's, it's, it's interesting. What would fascinate me was, was the chart you had run by decades uh, and enthusiasm versus non-enthusiasm uh, for, for stocks. And the one thing that struck me is, is as, as I was coming out here, as I went through that bookstore here in the day store in Chicago, with the intersection of the HK Concourse, Barbara's name, it's called Mr. Smith. Uh, I did not find one book there. Uh, that I would call an investing book. Nothing by you, nothing by Susan Orton, nothing by Jim Green. Uh, the scenes <laughs> are <laughs> uh, 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 lack of interest in investing uh, among the general public. Uh, these people can be trusted in what they did, and they would be interested, and now they're just not interested. They shouldn't be suffering. Anyway, I find that fairly, uh, fairly bullish. Well, you know, the, the investment books that sell are those that promise riches, um, wealth without risk, without a risk. Uh, you know, Peter Lynch's books, I think, sold well. Uh, at a time he was doing very well, I guess he's probably not doing so well now. Uh, and uh, that's a whole other story in and of itself. Uh, a good example of something that's got too big to do, I think. A lot of my surprise, you know, when Magellan got to be a hundred billion dollars, it should have been an index fund. And never should have been saved while he was what it was cost. But they got to market timing, you'll recall that. And uh, they got like a 25% cash position, and the stocks kept. Unfortunately for the manager going up. And just one more example of how you can't really manage money in big size. Uh, and they uh, shouldn't, shouldn't try it. They've done all kinds of funny things. And they're always late to do them with looking back, putting in an international in much after its work. And uh, so I'm very few people, I can tell you this, are going to look at the book there as I did, duh, again, uh, 10 years ago, and put it out again 10 years later. I mean, most of the books that were written 10 years ago were disasters. Uh, and people that bought them were just, you know, I don't, I don't know, people buy these books. Uh, we know that. And I just hope they don't do what the authors tell them to do. <laughs> but then what's the point of buying books? I mean, one of my favorite uh, 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 you know, methods of estimating the level of risk premium is, you know, it's your method. But the other thing I do is I do look at bookshelves. <coughs> Uh, and when you, you know, see Dow 36,000, Dow 50,000, how we become a millionaire in 10 minutes, when those are filled in the shelves, you know the, the, the risk premium, the expected risk premium is low. Uh, and, and when you see, you know, what's entitled the depression of 2015, how we a disaster, how about well, you know the stock, uh, the, the equity risk premium is, is, is fairly high. The other question I have for you about your slides. Let me just interject one second, though. You mentioned Dow 36,000. Not exactly a brilliant uh, exercise in market forecasting and timing. <laughs> and uh, so Jim Glassman has written another book. And it's called Dow 10,000. No, it's not. <laughs> he has a new theory, and it's called Margin of Safety. And he wants me to endorse it. <laughs> and I shouldn't tell you, because you've actually made a good soul. That I did, because I know the guy that I want to be a nice guy. I did endorse um, down 36,000. Uh, but I said, don't be deceived by the title. We're going to get to 36,000. But it's going to be a long, long road and a very bumpy one. So we probably will get to 36,000 someday, maybe 2050. I don't know, 2035. I get to the map. Uh, but uh, I don't even want to endorse this one. I just don't want to play a good one. I mean, one of the great really triumphs you know, of really human so organism is that people still use the last one. The triumph of hope over experience. Yeah, there we go. The strategy you had, Jack, that fascinated me most was the, the dollar rate versus time rate gap for the ETFs. 
And I don't know if we have these data, but I'd be very interested to know is, are the gaps bigger for the ETFs than for the corresponding funds? If you take those Vanguard funds that have both classes, uh, is the gap higher for the ETFs than the uh, industrial animal class shares, the open end shares? Yeah, that's a very good question. Actually, we looked at it, like I said, a month use the chart. Uh, not because it did not show what you expect it to show, what I expect it to show. The fund was in stronger hands than the ETF. But rather, we had some struggle with getting the numbers right, that the money goes out of the investor class and into the admiral class. So it can be done, and Kevin and I are going to do some work on that. Uh, but in your intuition, and in this case, I think it's usually right, uh, and in this case, I think it is right, is that the gap, and we've done this earlier, <coughs> said a couple of things, that's just going on at all, showed very clearly the gap is much smaller than the, uh, in the, uh, Thing right in the next one in the yeah, it get much closer. Sometimes it did almost exactly as well as the index itself. In the regular fund, it had the same lack of pressure as the other funds. But it's hard to calculate what's going on in ETS because that daily volume, uh, which is the only way we have of measuring you know, how much money is coming in and going out, it's very hard to do. But you get a daily volume if uh, an ETF uh, has a, I don't know, a million shares traded in a given day. We have no way of knowing whether it's a million purchases or a million sales. Okay, it's a million volume, and somebody may be coming up and picking up, you know, they have to equalize, someone has to be the market maker there, and it's a million sales, they've got to be taking it in and letting it out. And it's a million purchases, they've got to be investing it. But there's no difference in how you read the volume. So we're still struggling with that, but I'm sure, I, I thought about not showing you that chart, uh, but uh, I think that's the best we can do to illustrate this point. What happens, as I said this morning, that I think it was 270 out of 275 funds or roughly those kind of numbers, and it must be more than that in this collaboration. Should, should the investors in this room be all worried that their strong hands are being disadvantaged by the weak hands of these that class of shares that they have? Well, in general, I think the answer to that is no, uh, because those weak hands will give you aberrations in the market. We saw this with particular clarity, maybe too much clarity in the flash crash. But at the end of the day, or at the end of the week at least, uh, you were just as well as the flash crash for you if you don't share through that. You were just as well off or as well ill off as for that matter as you were before the crash ever happened. It didn't matter. In the long run, those market imperfections don't matter. They're noise. There, as I've often said, my tail is by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Quoting Mr. Shakespeare on a slightly different subject. On the other hand, there is something uh, that I worry a little bit about, and I actually got a piece of data that I decided not to use this morning, but I'll give it to you now. And then as I start to think about uh, what's going on in emerging markets, clearly very popular, I think uh, two of the largest ten marketplaces, the black market, I should say, may or are. Uh, two of the emerging market, excuse me, emerging market funds are in the, are, are two of the five or six largest uh, ETFs, maybe, maybe two of the, maybe two of the eight largest ETFs. And uh, when we look at the data, we found that 33% of all emerging market holdings in mutual funds, 33% of their holdings were in ETFs. And if ETF investors are traders, then that makes me worry. You know, supposing something happens to a big emerging market, uh, supposing something happens to China, uh, supposing something happens to Brazil, one of the popular recent favorites, uh, and the ETF people decide to get out, there could be a big gap because of the marketplace in poisoning that market with 30 33% of the market to be held by self identified traders, if you will. Uh, and uh, so it concerns me when the ETFs dominate in terms of holdings in any category. Now still, in the long run, uh, that should not matter. But if, if the ETF, uh, the, I'm sorry, the emerging market funds are held up by, by mutual fund demand, uh, then when they go, you could make a permanent trade on the emerging market return. I don't think it would do that. Uh, that's one thing I worry about. And I particularly think that we at Vanguard, as I should say we at Vanguard, Vanguard, I should be very careful about getting into these 
spectacle of fun. And, uh, and maybe focus on trying to offer our ETS, for example, on, on uh, to the managers that meet certain qualifications, to the investment body that meet certain qualifications. And uh, I read in, in one band of our piece the other day that you're apparently going to disqualify to make more than 25 trades in any six month period. 25 trades in a six month period? <laughs> I mean, really? Uh, maybe 25 trades in your life. <laughs> maybe 25 trades in your wife and your life together. Uh, and the life of your children and grandchildren. Uh, you can go on and on, but I, it's, it just it troubles me. It's not good for investors only. It's not good for people at all. And uh, as I mentioned this morning, a lot of the worst brands reverse this and that, two times up, two times down, three times up, three times down, and multiplying the effects of the market, and that seemed to be losing market share. And, and a lot of ETS in their business. I wonder about Wisdom Tree. They aren't doing very well, and they're a publicly held company, so we know how much cash they got left. They didn't much, is it, Kevin? Yeah. Didn't they have to raise a little bit? They did raise a little bit, yeah. <laughs> Mutual fund company that deals only with advisors. Um, <laughs> I like that idea. Um, you know, I think that if I hear the term new normal for one more time, I won't be responsible for my actions. <laughs> uh, this concept that, that, you know, not, you know, that the emerging markets are where it's at, because that's where the economic growth is. You know, I think most of you know how I feel about that, which is that there's an inverse relationship between economic growth. And and, uh, and and stock returns. The problem he has to do with with, with dilution. Uh, and when people you know people talk about returning in emerging markets, uh, and a bull market by definition, bubble loss by definition, is a market where people only think about return and not risk. Uh, twice in the past 15 years, the leading index of emerging market stocks has lost about two thirds of its value. Uh, and you can bet that most of the people who are investing in the EWO and for that matter, I even wonder about the DFA Emerging Markets Value Fund, which has a spectacular record and is also now DFA's biggest fund, uh, may not also have uh, the same problem. Uh, my <coughs> next point of mention is one of the other. I hope Steve Dunn doesn't get angry at me for this, but I think he, Steve demonstrated to me the proper response to the flash crash, which was when Jack was talking about he leaned over to me and said, what was the flash crash? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Steve. Yeah, but, but that's, that, was, that was the right response. You know? uh, you know, I'm not sure that I have that much about that. Did you say, should we have more questions? Uh, sure. Uh, Unless you have something to do. Let me ask you, um, <coughs> how would you size up my crash operations? Um, I think Don't that, take this really by the way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. yeah, I, mean, yeah. I was trying to drown you out, so I'm going to hear you. I like to put it in terms of, of real terms. Uh, so I see real uh, quarter earnings on a per capita, on a per share basis. If you look at uh, Schiller's data, uh, around a percent and a half if you're lucky. Uh, you got two percent dividend yield, so that's three and a half percent. When I look at bonds, um, and I'm wondering about the real returns for bonds, I start to get trembling. Uh, because I think that what you show is the best case scenario. Uh, I think that the four percent return for bonds, the two percent inflation on top of that, the two percent historical return. Um, I think that's the best case scenario. I think that in a worst case scenario, uh, 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 we could see real inflation, uh, not even, even forgetting about, about fiscal analysis that, that we need. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, uh, falls in, in the bond market in the past several decades of 50% on the long bond. Uh, and I worry about that risk. So, uh, my default bond position is, is a very short treasury less than a year. 
which has an expected real return of minus 1.5%. Uh, and I, I think that's acceptable because I don't think it's going to be minus 1.5% for very long. And, and, and I'm very afraid of taking the risk of a spectacularly large negative uh, return if you, if you, if you uh, 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 buy bonds of the duration. Yes, you may wind up with nominal uh, 4% return if you hold a bond for 10 years. But inflation is averaging uh, 6 or 7 or 8 or 9% over that period of time. Uh, you're not going to be happy with, with that uh, duration. Um, you know, I, I, I think that's, that, that, that's, that's the long and the short of it. I don't see any other asset classes that really fall too far outside of that. Uh, okay, let me say a couple of things about real returns. At first, the reason we use two percent essentially is that's what the, uh, the spread between the uh, the inflation hedge ten-year bond and the regular ten-year bond is the same. The market is called two percent inflation. Uh, very clear on the bill, and I think it's going to be higher than that. And how much higher? I have no way of knowing. And of course, there's always this possibility of some kind of a really bad economic situation. That, that might only be one percent. I mean, who really knows? In the depression, we had negative CPIs uh, for years, three, four, five years. So um, don't take two percent as a part of faith. Uh, one reason I don't, I haven't spent a lot of time, I've spent a fair time, but not a lot, on looking at real returns as compared to nominal returns, is that real returns take the same amount of all bond return on and stocks and bonds, take the same amount of all both, it's three percent. Bonds will return 3% less than their nominal return. Stocks will return 3% less than their nominal return. So, you know, you're not money in the water as much uh, by using, you know, nominal returns. Except to say that once you get, you know, you think about this, and I think I wrote about this in maybe a little bit of common sense investing, uh, and that is when you start taking these numbers down in real terms, then expenses really have an impact. I mean, you can take two and a half percent out of seven, uh, and I think we were using two percent inflation in that one. All of a sudden, let's just say a third of the return is consumed uh, by inflation, and you take that five, and it's uh, half of the return is consumed by by uh, by cost. We've got this inflation before, I and mean, cost half of it. And uh, you know, if you, if you think about half your cost, you take Take two uh, percent out of seven, that gives you five. Take two and a half percent, four out of five, that's two and a half. That's a hundred percent of the return you get. We'll put that in a different way, and it just becomes just overpowering. In other words, if, I guess if I was smart or more a marketing kind of person, I would always use real because the impact of cost uh, just is magnified, and magnified, and magnified over and over again. So in other words, the tips yield, let's say, is 1.4% of the long end right now. 
But that's really higher than it should be because it has to be higher because of the liquidity problems and the liquidity shocks that you can have, which we certainly saw during, not very during the uh, crisis. And during the crisis, the long plane of our treasury was soaring in value, uh, and the long tips climbing, I think the long tips fell by something like 20 or 25 uh, percent. So it's a liquidity premium index. So that number is higher than it should be, which means that it underestimates the flesh tracking lower number from the higher number, if lower number is bigger than it should be, then implied inflation is really good. So I don't think this implies 2% inflation. I think that what we're looking at probably implies at least 3% 3, 3 uh, inflation. So I agree with you that 2% is, is, is probably uh, an underestimate. Uh, well, we also, you might want to comment on this. Uh, how accurate is that question number? Yeah. It depends on what you're paying for. I mean, if you're if you're paying for you know computers uh, or you know you're buying long distance service, that's a pretty good number. Um, if you're buying healthcare, uh, lots of luck. If you're buying health insurance, lots of luck. The uh, I think I have my new book. I have no idea, but I can remember the number though. Uh, I mean, we made some substantial adjustments to the CPI. And uh, we had made those adjustments. Uh, the CBI over that period would have risen not 3% a year, but 8% a year, something like that. And uh, so we're right. again the victim of numbers, which is what this book is all about. It's an unreliable. We say, oh, inflation is blank. It all depends on what you're spending your money on. And it all depends on, you know, a lot, a lot of things on politics. And I heard in the radio the other day that Social Security is going to have no call up this year. There isn't any inflation by their measure. Well, that's probably long overdue. We have to fix that system and call it a problem. Yeah. And since I've discovered happy hours, my own personal inflation rate is sort of new, but that's how I set up my health care costs. <laughs> 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 Bill? Yeah. I got a question for you. Not only that and Bill, but the gentleman who uh, was instrumental in starting the thrift savings plan, anybody else who wants to comment? I have always felt that, in fact, when I was writing early on, in fact, in December of 1999, when everyone was in love with their 401k plan, I really want to call them that the 401k plan is going to be a debacle like the likes of which this country has never seen. And in last year, Time Magazine had a cover story saying it's the time to retire the 401k plan. Retire the 401k plan. Um, I've always felt that it's ludicrous to think that the average intelligent person can save enough money and invest it wisely and then withdraw it in an intelligent manner over a 60 or 70 year period. It's just asking too much. It's not that they are smart, intelligent people, but it's just a god to pass. My question is, how close are we to a system where it may be more like chilies or something, where a person is kind of forced to save as a combination with my contribution combined private combined benefit plan where somebody saves enough money and then they put it into like a single premium inflation adjusted annuity where they're kind of forced to do that so that they're focused not on how much emerging markets they have but how much they're saving and how that equates to withdrawing 30, 40, 50 years down the road. Let me, let me, let me tackle that one first. Um, first of all, Bill, you probably all couldn't say it better myself. Uh, I mean, I agree with everything you said. I think that our, our, um, our 401k system is an the, the shift from defined benefit to defined contribution is a social experiment that has failed catastrophically. Um, you know, the basic, my basic concept is the less autonomy you give people, the better. The more choices you give them, the worse things you want to be for them. So, sure, force them to do all those things, but heck, why not put the money into a independently run pension plan that is perfectly transparent and that doesn't even give them the option of annuitizing? I mean, it is annuitized. Exactly. I've been wrong with that. I'm, I'm all for a big percentage of the I personally uh, think that a lot of people would sign up for the heart of people who are transparent, who are low cost, and so that all they had to do was say, okay. I deal with this every day. People are coming to me. Tell me how much I need to save. I'll do it. Yeah. I 
Yeah. Yeah. There's so many others. A gazillion other moving parts. And, and nobody got people thinking about, well, how much should I be putting in emerging markets and this and that? And it's like, that's the last thing you need to be worried about. What they need to be worried about is what our grandfathers and grandmothers worried about. And that's saying it's saving more than we spend. And then I think the last thing I should bring them all bad ideas too, right? <laughs> I don't think the ICI likes anything. <laughs> the, let, let me say something about the 401k and the general business in our current plans. Uh, and that is, think about what it is and how discouraging it therefore is. One, you can borrow money from it. Two, when you change jobs, and maybe when you don't change jobs, you can just take all your money out and do whatever you want. Three, you don't have to make a contribution to the pull out. Four, your company can cut back the contributions or eliminate them whenever they want, and they do that and do that to a significant extent. Five, I guess, you really get no guidance, no significant guidance from your companies. I thought the companies a long time ago, when we first got into the 401k, I guess it would have been the late 70s or early 80s when they started. It seemed like a natural market for them, where it turned out to be much more complicated than I thought. That never bothered me. And, and, uh, uh, it seemed like the ideal way to go with an index fund, low cost, uh, old forever, right up our alley. And it turned out that people want Magellan funds, it's popular for a one page choice. When you give investors their choices, that's what they do. And now it's Growth Fund of America. And I guess index is maybe third, something like that. And the most popular is that. Not so bad, there's too much uh, junk running around there. So, with all those flaws, how can it possibly lead? Comfortable retirement. And of course, the answer is to look at the data. It doesn't. The average accumulation in the 401k is, I mean, I can't even really remember the exact number, it's somewhere between $34,000 and $54,000. Well, having a great retirement, invest in your friendly neighborhood mutual funds and delivering 1% extra expenses out of these conditions. So if you got $54,000, you got $540 a year. Is that right? It's, you know, that can go on the and when, when you get a net in your fender, <laughs> think about that. Um, and uh, so the way to improve it is to eliminate the flaws. Uh, it's, it's actually, believe it or not, not that far from what um, President Bush, who never turned his idea of privatizing Social Security into a, into a, uh, into a reform firm proposal, but it's basically a personal retirement plan privatized. So you have your own account. The government can't take it away from you. Uh, you know, you're not dependent on somebody else telling you what the cost of living is, or how much the payouts are going to be, and all that. And you have your own plan, pension plan, or or a crop sharing plan, or a defined contribution plan, or, or defined plan. <coughs> and you have all the flaws. And uh, then we have to make sure that you know, I, I'd like to leave it to private enterprise because I've often said we need some sort of a government board to give you a uh, seal of approval for eligibility to have your shares that have a mutual management company's shares in the plan. And if you don't have a low cost, forget it. And if you're going to have high turnover, forget it. And if you've got big sales books, forget it. Those kind of things aren't acceptable. So you've got to keep them in as a sort of disciplinary thing. But only because it is. And you know, the known flaws and says, what, what do we know about all these millions and millions, tens of millions? Probably uh, 50 million people, or whatever the number is, who have um, have uh, defined contribution plans, uh, and that is, if we leave them to their own devices, they will get the market return, less astonishing costs. I mean, they can't all leave the market, right? Seems unlikely, and they really can't all lose to the market, as we were saying uh, earlier. That, you know, it's very hard to fail, and still have an average return with huge costs, and so that that is, that's just plain unacceptable. So you have to have some, I think, agency of some kind. Maybe it's a new consumer finance agency. I wouldn't know. But say these are the standards for getting in, and then let people compete at the best service and the best price. And, and uh, but, but without all the, with rigidities to preclude the exercise of free will, and that doesn't make you popular. But we all know what the facts are. And that's when you put them very well. The more more choices you have, and like I said, the more decisions you have, and the more flexibility you have. More likely it is you will end up with something that will not be right back. My favorite factoid about four hundred one k's is similar to your observation, which is the last I saw Cerulean Associates data 
the, you know, if you look at people pre-retirement, 60 to 64, the median, the, excuse me, the average uh, uh, 401k balance was about 70,000, but the median was like 25,000. <coughs> The average cost, out-of-pocket costs for healthcare for the average Medicare recipient from age 65 to demise is a quarter of a million dollars. Yield. Okay, so it's just like having tips. It yields 6%. Not quite as good, but 
city is in Zimbabwe. Okay. Uh, just make my, uh, you're talking about stock, stocks with dividends. Isn't it, uh, I didn't think all stocks pay dividends. It's a beginner question here, but I know there's lots of stocks that don't pay dividends, so you're accounting for that somehow. Well, all stocks don't pay dividends, and we take the S&P, the total stock market, we just take the aggregate dividends paid by all the companies. And I would guess that probably 20% of corporations do not. Most of them are going to be on NASDAQ and not listed. Uh, most of them are going to have short histories compared to long histories. Uh, and uh, in the long run, you know, you be very clear on this. The value of a stock is a discounted value of its future cash flow. There's no way around that. And the only cash flow you get from a stock is its dividend. Years ago, a company came along, and it was a growth company in the market business. I'll tell you the name. You probably know what you've ever heard of it. It's long gone. And then they were on the cover of Time magazine, and they promised never to pay a dividend. We will never pay a dividend. This was considered a big selling point. Um, because they had, you know, they wanted to open a new store, I suppose, and all that. And uh, before they even had a chance to rethink, they were out of business. And the place was called, does anybody remember EJ Corvette? Yeah. yeah. That old. Yeah. Where is it now? I haven't seen it around for a while. Yeah. It's bankrupt. Uh, so dividends are an important sign of management's ability to spend cash. And I would argue, and I'd be interested in Bill's point on this, I think managers, corporate managers, are very bad users of cash flow. They merge, they start new businesses, they start new product lines, and they seem to invariably fail. Uh, and, and, and sometimes, for a, let's give you this little example, sometimes, because of the messed up nature, I almost use a bad word, uh, of, our, of, of our financial slash investment system. And uh, one example that comes to mind are the beleaguered uh, MBIA, Municipal Law Insurance, and financial FSA is called okay. Financial Security, they both insured municipal bonds. And of course, Wall Street wanted them to grow 10% a year. As a bank, you could grow 10% a year over time. You can. Uh, so there were no more municipal bonds to insure. They insured them all. So they were held the growth of the mutual fund of the municipal bond market. And that's maybe has a 1% or 2% growth rate. Not good enough. We'll have to find something else to insure. I've got an idea. Let's insure collateralized debt obligations. <laughs> <laughs> and so they did. And where are they now? I think they're technically bankrupt, except those municipal ones have such a long tail. And then they have now a lot of litigation going on. I want to get into this over my, over my desk and say to my viewers. But they separated MBIA into two things. CDO portfolio and the muni portfolio. And now they got litigation from bondholders who got one portfolio, they got a portfolio that they didn't want. Uh, so they charged out the bad portfolio and they got you know an interest in that. I'm not sure exactly how it worked. It's been in the market. So and I think mergers are done for corporate uh, ego, uh, corporate you know building complex uh, and uh, you know I gotta be a builder, I gotta be an imagine and the CEO comes in and says to the board, well, everything looks pretty fine to me. I don't think we need to do anything. <laughs> you know, probably 80% of the time, that's what he should say, but he can't. He's got to improve on his predecessor. He's got to prove himself to the board. And that means doing something. And uh, you, know, you can't say, if you say, well, I'm not going to do anything, and it works, they're saying, what do we need you for? <laughs> so it's a, it's, I'm not kidding really about this. And then you start to play accounting games. Make the earnings grow, you know, all this. And why the accountants haven't been all uh, gotten into more trouble about all this? I mean, they're not quite as bad as the rating and grading agencies. That's a pretty low bar, isn't it? Do <laughs> <laughs> uh, you agree with me on the corporate use of cash? I, 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 I can't think of one large corporate merger in the last 30 years that's worked out. Uh, and it is, it is going to be well. Let's start from first principles, all right? Uh, the economy grows, or productivity grows, at 2%. That's, that's one of the constants of capitalism uh, in the developed economy, okay, 2% growth. The China shouldn't grow, grow to be at 5 or 6 or 7 or 8% because you're catching up 
the technology. If you're, if you're in the leading edge, leading edge, two percent is as good as, 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 good as against the English nation. We get another percent in this country for population growth. So okay, we're three percent when things are really going to go wrong now and go long term. Uh, that's not what you see when you want to share a stock. A stock's to be the share pool of two percent. So it's two percent more shares every year. So that per share indicator only grows at a percent or a percent and a half. Now, what CEO, chairman of the board, is going to go before his or her shareholders and say, "I'm going to grow our earnings on a share basis at a percent and a half per year"? Don't you just love me? All right, no, he's going to grow at 10, 15 percent. And when to that 10, 15 percent growth, they start really doing the wrong things uh, and losing. The, the, the best example that I can think of, I mean, there's all sorts of data in the finance literature you don't want to know about that basically says that when corporations have to fund their projects externally, in other words, they have to borrow from the bank, from the bond holding public, the bond buying public, that they tend to do pretty well. But when they take the capital internally, it's not subject to the discipline of the marketplace. So they, take their, they take it from their cash flow or their cash pad. Uh, that these projects do very, very important because they're not subject to the same discipline. Finally, the best example that I can give is we now have a 30-year, a 40-year track record almost on real estate investment trusts, on real, on real estate investment trusts, uh, and and the return on REITs over the past 40 years, if I've gotten my facts straight, are about a percent or a percent and a half higher uh, than the overall market. Why? Because REITs have to distribute out 90% of their earnings in the public to the shareholders. All right? And then the shareholders get to decide how to deploy their capital and not the company. And that's why they do better. Well, let me add to that. I've seen this happen. I'm a director of a very large paper company now, go on. Uh, and uh, it's fun. The Fortune 500 company, the Fortune 200 company, actually. And so I saw what was happening. And but I finally concluded, after a long period of experience in the board, and it took me a long time to learn what it was all about, and learn how to behave as a board director, and not in my style. Uh, but it was a fun learning experience, but I found a couple of things. One, investment factors. Wall Street is always wanting to do a deal. This will not surprise any of you. So they come to the head of the company and say, well, I got a company for you. And they give you all this paper off, and you write the whole paper with this day. And, uh, so you look at all the numbers for the deal, and they don't look very good. So it's the problem of money is there are wheelers and dealers who make a living by getting companies to take over other companies. That's been banking. And, and then persuading companies to do something, not because it will increase their growth, but because when they put the two companies together, they will get synergies. So you know, it might be hundreds of millions of dollars a year of synergies, without which the numbers won't work. And you say this will be non dilutive maybe even a creative, uh, then the, the world believes you if you bring out all these numbers. But the accretion is because of these synergies you get, hundreds of millions of dollars. And then the deal is done, and we wait for the synergies to come in. And they don't announce themselves, like Santa Claus on Christmas Eve, coming in with a sleigh and eight tiny reindeer. Uh, you know, it's a kind of day-by-day -day thing, and other things happen. And the synergies, as far as I can see, never happen in any light. Uh, the way they were projected to happen. So uh, those two things put the odds on any kind of merger, and make them make the odds very long and over. As I said, I said this morning, 62%, 65% of these kind of uh, acquisitions and combinations fail um, on consulting terms. It's also advised people to do something. Because uh, there are limits, as Bill says, limits on what you can earn on capital is a competitive market, this is capitalism. That's a hard, harsh, unforgiving market, and, and corporations just, shoemakers would stick to their last, what used to be said, back in the days when there were shoemakers, one in Italy, I guess, um, that uh, these corporations think they can do all things to all people, and I just don't think they can prove that. And to me, it's one of the great mysteries of investing in capitalism is why sophisticated long-term investors don't realize that. All the always going to be able to try and buy companies that are going to grow. Smart thing to do is buy a company that sticks to its name and gives you a nice big fat healthy dividend and you get to decide to do it with a dividend. You know, one thing I think is a bit of a good about 
internal development in your company, it's a lot easier <coughs> to buy a company to emerge and cook the books than any of your balance sheet or a very expensive pool you have. But the truth may not come out for a long time. On the other hand, if, if you're not sticking to anything but trying to diversify, it's hard to start businesses in <coughs> three new areas. And that's why I think it's easier which quickly goes by point capital. Thank you very much. Thank Thank you. 